I'm going to start off with a quote, and as I'm reading it out, I want you to have a think about who might have said this quote. And if you do know, don't tell the people around, but just have a little think. Okay. What is happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders, they disobey their parents, they ignore the law, they write in the streets inflamed with wild notions, their morals are decaying. What is to become of them? Now, who do you think said this? Was it a modern day parent, perhaps, or a disgruntled social commentator, or perhaps a British politician? The answer, if you're wondering, is it was actually said by Plato in the fourth century BC. <laughs> And I'm using it today to contend that panics about youth are nothing new. In fact, panics about young people have actually been endlessly recycling since the beginning of history, with each generation of adults soon forgetting the rebellion of their own youth before projecting anxieties about the future onto their children. And whenever we see moral panics about young people, they tend to do two things. They tend to either demonise young people as deviants who are out of control and in need of discipline, so think, say, Lindsay Lohan or, closer to home, Corey Worthington, the party boy, or alternatively, they construct young people as vulnerable victims in need of protection from the big bad world. So think the discourses around um, children, particularly female children. But what I want to argue is that the delinquent juvenile and the figure of the innocent vulnerable child are actually the two sides of the exact same coin, because both constructions serve to legitimise adult intervention and policing of young people. They also serve to infantilise young people and to render them silent. But I think we need to ask a few questions here. Firstly, to what extent are attempts to protect children really just attempts to control and police them? Secondly, at what point does a caring parent become a controlling parent? And thirdly, where exactly is the line between expressing healthy concern for young people and pathologising them en masse as deviant and morally deficient? And I'm not suggesting that these are easy questions to answer because, I mean, part of the, part of the issue is that each child is different and what will be an appropriate level of concern for one child may be excessive or insufficient for another child. But what is clear is that debates about young people still tend to be informed by panic, hysteria and a victimised view of youth. But books and newspaper articles which use fear-mongering tactics to whip up adult anxiety rarely do anything to actually help parents understand their teenagers, and they do even less to equip teenagers with the skills that they need to negotiate the risks in their world. And one of the things that we know is that exposure to risk is actually one of the ways in which young people learn. You know, we're so hung up on talking about children at risk and young people at risk, but risk can in fact be a good thing. When we do have panics about young people, there are three things that we see. The first is that when we demonise young people and pathologise them en masse, we tend to render them silent. And the result of this is they are usually the last to be heard, if at all, in public debates. The second thing is, is that when we demonise them, we usually see a whole bunch of um, educational programs as well as books like these which whip up further hysteria. Now, I'm not suggesting that these books are bad. In fact, um, I think they actually raise some really legitimate concerns individually. But collectively, they incite panic. And the third thing is that... Sorry. Um, the third thing is that when we demonise young people, we also demonise the cultural goods that are associated with them, from their fashion to the music that they listen to to the technologies that they use, be that technology like a skateboard or, say, social media. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, social media and, in particular, the issue of sexting. Now... Um, if, if you're wondering what sexting is, the basic definition of it is that it refers to the production and um, distribution of sexualised image, imagery via mobile phone or webcam. But I don't really like the term sexting, and in fact my first piece of advice is that if anybody wants to run an education program on sexting, you shouldn't call it sexting because teenagers don't call it sexting. And here are some quotes from young people. Sexting, a term created by the media referring to sending sexually explicit text messages. The term is used by adults who are out of the loop and not by individuals actually sending the messages. Or another one. Sorry. Sexting, an extremely lame term for the act of sending a sexual text message most commonly used by people trying to sound hip or in some cases used in contempt by those explaining how stupid the word sounds. 
<laughs> so when I started looking at sexting um, and the media debates around it, I'm sure you've all seen media articles about you know, the problem of teenage sexting. And what I realised is that there is often a disparity between perceived risk and actual risk. Um, so, for example, the strange danger programs that I grew up around were a response to the, the fear of the pedophile who was supposedly lurking in every park and street corner. But as we know, of course, with sexual violence, it's far more likely to be somebody known to the victim. So the whole strange danger campaign actually derailed um, uh, what, what some of the true issues were. So I wanted to have a look at well, what are the perceived risks that the media report on when it comes to sexting. And what I did was I did a six-month content analysis where I looked at newspaper reporting around sexting. I looked in total at 734 newspaper articles. Now, the first thing to tell you about sexting is that the biggest group of sexes is not teenage girls. It's actually adult gay men. The second group after adult gay men is actually adult heterosexual couples. And then down the bottom, we actually have teenage girls and teenage boys who, incidentally, are doing it at approximately the same rate. So of my 730 newspaper articles, exactly how many mentioned gay sexting? Not one. The second thing is, if we know that boys and girls are doing this at approximately the same rate, how many mentioned boys' reputations? Once again, not one. So what were the concerns that they mentioned then? And what I realised was that the, the concerns were highly gendered. So for girls, it was shame, humiliation, embarrassment, bullying, school changes, pregnancy. And I thought, oh, this is an interesting one. How does taking a photo of yourself lead to pregnancy? Maybe, you know, I've been doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> Prostitution, self-harm, eating disorders, sexual assaults, suicide ideation, and in some cases, suicide. So these are the perceived risks for girls. For boys, on the other hand, we only have two. The first is that it could lead to prosecution. The second is that it could lead to porn addiction. I'll point out at this stage, though, that there is no research to back this up. Okay, so of the 734 newspaper articles, one of the things that I noticed was the most common recurring um, thing in it was this statistic, that one in five teenagers has engaged in sexting. Now, this statistic comes from the, uh, from an America, the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy in America. And I wanted to know, well, how did they arrive at this statistic? So I went back to their uh, research tool and to their data. And what they'd done was they'd done a survey. Now, the survey was actually self-selecting. So anybody who knows anything about research methodology knows that self-selecting opt-in surveys are really problematic and they don't deliver sound results. The second thing was I wanted to know, well, how are they defining sexting? And they defined it as sent or received a nude or semi-nude image. And I thought, aha, this is interesting. What's a semi-nude image? So, for example, if is a girl in um, a bikini or, say, a bra, is that a semi-nude image? What about a boy who's just had a shower and come out and he's got a towel around his waist? Is that a se semi-nude image? It turns out they are. It turns out the bikini shots are actually deemed semi-nude images. So at best, what we know is that one in five teenagers has seen an image of somebody in their swimsuits. Now, I don't know if we should be really panicking about this statistic at this point. And it's not just in America. Yesterday, I actually filled out a survey which has been completed by the Office of Victorian Privacy Commissioner. Sorry. Um, and I looked at their definition of sexting. And here, here's what it was. Have you ever taken or sent a nude or semi-nude clothed uh, photo of yourself or someone else on your mobile phone? This includes photos of people in underwear or swimwear. Now, OK, there's a couple of issues here. Firstly, I suspect that 100% of teenagers has seen or received or taken an, a photo in their swimwear. So I, I, you know, when the results of this come out, I wouldn't be surprised if we're seeing somewhere between 90 and 100% saying they've been engaged in sexting. The second thing was, in order for me to actually have a look at um, their survey, I actually had to fill out the survey. But because I'm from New South Wales and you have to be in Victoria, I just had to fudge my way through it. So apparently, I'm a 14-year-old boy who lives in Melbourne CBD. Um, so right there, their results are actually going to be skewed because the reality is there is no quality control in these surveys. So what are the actual concerns? Because I don't want to dismiss this sexting issue because I think that there are legitimate concerns. And for me, there are three things that we need to focus on. With images, it's the ease with which they are produced, the speed at which they can travel, and the permanence of them once they're online. And I think these three things have radically changed the cultural landscape. Um, now, 
This is an image of a young woman called um, Jessie Logan. Jessie Logan was an 18-year-old in America who took a nude image of herself, sent it to her boyfriend, and when they broke up, he distributed it without her consent to third parties. She was horrendously bullied. She was labelled a slut and a whore, and soon after, her body was found hanging in her bedroom. Um, now, this is one of the most, when you look at media articles about sexting, the Jessie Logan case is cited frequently. And I don't in any way want to minimise or diminish um, the severity of this case, but one thing that I do want to point out is that when you look into the reporting of Jesse Logan, there are in total 125,000 news items about the Jesse Logan suicide. Of them, what almost none of those articles point out was on, that on the day that she committed suicide, it was actually many, many months after the sexting incident had taken place, and the day that she committed suicide, she'd actually been at her best friend's funeral, who committed suicide in the exact same way. Now, very few of the articles actually mention this, and I actually think that that's, it's either lazy journalism at best, or it's actually intellectually dishonest. And I think that you need to have that bit of information, because if we're going to talk about youth suicide, we need to be talking about other things, including suicide contagion. Um, the second issue, incident that I want to talk about is a guy called Tyler Clementi. Um, he was gay, he was not publicly out as gay, and his college roommate filmed him, unbeknownst to him, um, engaging in sexual acts with a male partner. Um, that footage was then streamed around the college, and Tyler Clementi then committed suicide, and his final Facebook message was jumping off the George Washington Bridge, sorry. Now, I think that in this case it's pretty apparent that, um, that this suicide is actually directly related to that bullying and humiliation. But once again, I don't want to demonise the technology here. I think we also need to think about the issues of bullying, about the issues of homophobia, and about the issues of why it is that young gay men have significantly higher suicide attempts and suicide completion rates compared to other groups. Um, third case study that I want to mention was um, uh, at ADFA, an 18-year-old woman called Kate engaged in consensual sex with a fellow male cadet, but unbeknownst to her, he had set up a webcam and that was being live streamed to six guys in an adjacent room. Um, and once again, I think that, you know, when we're talking about images which were either produced without consent or distributed to third parties without consent, this is a really ethically and legally horrendous crime. Like, I, I just think it's, I think it's appalling. But what I found interesting was in the media commentary around this, I kept hearing the words new technology and new problems, and I thought, is it? Is it really? Does anyone remember a little film called American Pie? Now, this film came out in 1999, and in this film there is a scene where this, the main character, Jim, sets up a webcam to film this girl, Nadia, getting changed without her knowledge, and that footage is being live-streamed to about six guys in an adjacent building. In other words, we've, at, we've actually got a very, very high correlation between these two things. So this film came out 12 years ago, meaning that when I'm speaking to 15-year-olds, they were three when this movie came out. So for them, this isn't some new technology and it's not some new problem. It is the world that they have grown up in, and I think as adults we need to get our heads around that in our discussions with young people. But I do want to move on to the laws. So I'm going to use the case study of Greensburg, Pennsylvania, where three teenage girls um, took semi-nude photos of themselves. So they were wearing bras, um, so opaque bras took these photos, sent it to their three respective boyfriends. Now, those boyfriends didn't do anything with the images. They didn't forward them on. They didn't show them to people. They just had them on their individual mobile phones. But one day, when they were in class, they were doing something they weren't meant to be doing on their mobile phones, like playing a game or whatever it might be, and their phones got confiscated. The school principal then went through the phones and found these images, and he decided to contact the police. Now, I want you to have a think. Who do you think is going to get in trouble with the police here? Is it going to be the girls for taking the photos, the boys for owning the photos, or the principal for invading their privacy? The answer in this particular case was it was the three girls. And they're actually charged with production and distribution of child pornography for photographing their own bodies. Now, I think that this raises some, um, some questions. Oh, and if found guilty, they would be put on the sex offender register for the rest of their lives, meaning a whole bunch of things. So it would mean that they would have to declare themselves as a sex offender. It would mean that if they ever have children, they're not going to be able to you know, coach their, their sporting teams or help out in reading groups or anything like that. And everywhere they go, they have to declare themselves as that. 
So I think that this raises a few questions. Um, the first is, you know, child pornography laws were put in place to protect children, not to criminalise teenage sexuality. And do we really want to be grouping sexually curious teenagers in with convicted pedophiles and gang rapists? Is that, is that really where they belong? And more than that, um, you know, I, I'm actually really strongly opposed and appalled by acts of sexual violence. And I think we need to preserve the sex offender register for people who actually represent real threats to the community, not for sexually curious teenagers. Um, so, and I should point out that we have the exact same laws in, in Australia. So I recently spoke to a boy in Victoria who had received an image of his girlfriend. He didn't do anything with that image, but when his parents found it and reported it to the police to give him a scare, he was charged with child pornography offences, found guilty, and is now on the sex offender register. Um, I think that this is appalling and I think that we need urgent law reform. My view is that what we should actually be doing is we should be dealing with this in the classrooms, not the courtrooms. And I'm just going to talk briefly about education. Um, so at the moment, in New South Wales, we have this campaign, safe sexting, no such thing. And I've looked at it and I thought, yeah, fair enough. Except that that's a just don't do it campaign. That's an abstinence campaign. And what do we know about abstinence campaigns? They don't work. So my criticisms of the current programs are, aside from the fact that most of them are abstinence-based, not evidence-based, they also tend to only look at the legal consequences. So with my work with the NRL, um, the Australian Federal Police also do a workshop about sexting, and they say, if you've got an image of a girl under the age of 18, that is child pornography, you can go to jail. They then come to my seminar and I give them a scenario that says, um, you know, you're on the team bus, your phone beeps, you get this picture and it's of a 17 year old girl performing a particular sex act on one of the players who is a mate of yours. What do you do? Probably the number one response that I get from this question is that they say, well, I wouldn't forward it because that police lady told us we could go to jail. So what I'd do is I'd pass the phone around the bus so all the boys can have a good look, and then I'd delete it, because that way I won't get in trouble. And I say to the police, this is exactly what you're going to get if you teach people laws, but you don't teach them ethics. And this is why we need ethics-based education. Um, just briefly, my other criticisms are that um, none of these programs have been developed in consultation with young people or evaluated by them. They tend to demonise the technology um, and they um, pathologise teenage sexuality as inherently dangerous polluting. They often try and shame girls as a way of getting them to abstain. Um, and the method of delivery, they usually kind of tick the box one-off exercises as opposed to being um, integrated within to the curriculum and syllabus. So how, how much longer have I got? A few minutes? Okay. Um, okay, I'll skip through what a best practice approach would look like. Um, but I suppose the biggest thing that I think we need to do is actually um, to develop programs in consultation with young people. Because if we make assumptions about what the drivers of the behaviour are and we get those assumptions wrong, then any programs we develop aren't actually going to marry up with what young people are doing. So that's what my research has been doing, is actually asking teenagers, well, you know, what's going on? Just quickly, here's what they tell me. Firstly, group sexting starts first. Now what I mean by this is from the age of about 12, you'll get um, a group of girls at a sleepover party, a group of boys at a sleepover party, they'll set up a webcam and they'll play truth or dare. And at some point in the truth or dare, somebody will dare somebody to flash a body part. Um, now for them, this is not even sexual. Um, this is actually, you know, the sort of equivalent of boys mooning out the back of the school bus on the way to school camp. Um, it's about pushing boundaries. It's the same sort of, you know, Bart Simpson photocopying his bum on the school photocopier. It's that level of engagement. Um, as they get older, though, um, they do start to do it for sexual reasons. But a lot of the girls are actually saying that it's a non-threatening way to explore their sexuality. So what I mean by this is that they'll say things like, well, you know, if I'm at a party and I'm hooking up with a guy and we're a bit drunk, um, and then he says something confusing to me like, well, if you really loved me, you'd do this, that's a pretty difficult situation to navigate your way around and out of. Whereas online, they're saying there is literally a button that you can press that will shut the whole situation down. Um, they're also saying things like, well, you know, I'm not going to get pregnant or an STD, because at school, what do we tell them? We tell them that pregnancy and STDs are the big risks. And I guess the other thing to mention that's interesting is that as adults, we're so concerned about the distribution side because we say, once these images are out there, you have no control. And that is true. What they do have full control over, though, is the production side. So girls will say, you know, I'll take 25 photos and I'll delete the 24 that I don't like. And the one that I send is the one where I, I like the angling, I like the lighting, I'm in control of it. And one girl said to me, well, you know, um, 
It'd be really nerve-wracking to get undressed in front of a guy for the first time, but this way I get to control exactly what he sees and exactly what he doesn't see. So they're actually figuring it through a lens of control, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, just, I'm just about to finish up. Um, they do tell me that they don't understand the laws. The girls also tell me, which is kind of interesting, that there's a lot of pleasure that they get around this. So because most pornography is made by men for men, we've kind of assumed that women aren't visual creatures. That's not the case. Um, but we do know that the girls' images circulate a lot quicker. So boys and girls are producing at about the same rate, but if the image is of a girl, it will go viral because other girls will share it in order to shame her. Boys will share it as entertainment. If the image is of a boy, girls will share it, but not as much, and boys definitely won't share it because they don't want to be seen to be in possession of another boy's penis on their phone. Um, the number one reason why they do not come forward, though, is fear that the technology will be removed and as to the question of do they have any sense of privacy, the answer is yes, they do. It's just different to yours. So, um, so they define privacy in relation to authority figures, um, meaning that something is private, provided that mum and dad and the teachers don't know.